Um, I am Vincent. I'm the Secretary General of the Social Enterprise Summit. Uh, so basically, if you have any complaints, it all goes to me. So uh, don't try to turn this into a complaint session yet, okay? I will be here until 5.30 this afternoon, okay? But feel free to give me any suggestions. Uh, so far, we got um, all the good comments so far because of the speakers. So uh, we have speakers from 13 countries this year. So it's, it's really good. It's really good. And um, just give you some background information. Um, be, be, besides being the Secretary General of the Sec Social Enterprise Summit, I'm also one of the directors of, the co of a co-working space in Hong Kong called the Good Lab. The Good Lab is the only social entrepreneur working space in Hong Kong. Uh, Four years ago, when, or three and a half years ago, when the Good Lab started, there are basically only three co-working spaces in Hong Kong. Now, after three and a half years, there are 41 co-working spaces here in Hong Kong. And the other 40 basically are all IT related or design related. So co-working space in Hong Kong and the rest of Asia has been booming, particularly in Taiwan, in uh, Korea, not only Seoul, but also uh, the, the other secondary tier cities in, in, in Korea as well. Without further ado, can I ask you to put a really big hand for our two speakers. From Scotland, we have Miss Karen McGregor from uh, CEO of First Pot UK, Karen. Uh, she will talk about not only her, her venture, but also uh, background about uh, what the Scotland government has been doing to promote social enterprises. Uh, we have probably heard too many uh, London ca cases from London, but Scotland is completely different, right? <laughs> and then we also have uh, Mr. Busan Tijani. Is it Tijani? Yes, thank you. Uh, from Nigeria, our African speaker. <laughs> possibly the farthest away. You're, you're, you're from the country farthest away from Hong Kong so far. Eight years. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, and, uh, again, uh, feel free to sit in the front. We can feel your energy if you sit in the front. Uh, there's a statistics by Stanford two years ago. People who sit in the front normally got higher GPA in, uh, in Stanford. So it's statistically more relevant if you sit in the front and you can get more out of it, all right? So, uh, uh, so without further ado, Karen, I leave the stage to you. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, hi. And uh, a nice picture in the background. <laughs> People in Scotland like to paint their faces. <laughs> um, Thank you, Vincent. Um, thank you for this opportunity to take part in the Hong Kong um, Social Enterprise Symposium. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, it was my first time in Hong Kong, um, but I don't think it will be my last. I think I'll definitely be visiting um, again. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Karen, and I'm the CEO of First Port. And Vincent asked me along here today to share the Scottish story. So I'd like to begin with an overview of Scotland and the development of social enterprise in Scotland. And then I'll share with you some of the stories um, from the first port experience and also some of the people that we've had the pleasure of working with. So Scotland has an historic reputation um, for innovation and enterprise. And I don't know, have any of you ever met anyone from Scotland before? Yeah? I bet you within five minutes they told you we'd invented this, we'd invented that. So pretty much Scotland thinks it invented the modern world. Um, so in the background here, you see a very famous um, Scotsman, um, Alexander Graham Bell, and he invented the telephone. Um, but there were some other innovations around things like tarmac, penicillin, steam engine, and even radar. And more recently, um, I'm not going to claim we invented the gaming industry, but we did 
Um, produce one of the world's um, biggest um, games, Grand Theft Auto, which has now become a global phenomenon. I don't know if I should say this, but I've never actually played Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> so I'm not sure how good it is. So, part of this long history of innovations um, has been business models that don't just look at money. The very first documented example of the world's first um, cooperative actually dates back to Scotland in 1769. And indeed, the Scottish-born economist um, Adam Smith said himself in The Wealth of Nations, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. So let's fast forward to modern Scotland. And we have seen in the last 10 years an incredibly supportive framework from the Scottish Government for social enterprise. Now, in policy terms, social enterprise is located within the Communities Directorate and is referred to as third sector. Um, but what's strong about the government's approach is that we're now in, uh, hearing them increasingly make talk about social enterprise in mainstream business because they believe that you can create a more equal and fairer society at the same time as promoting economic competitiveness. In legislative terms, we've seen the Community Empowerment Act and this att attempts to transfer assets from government back to communities. And we've also seen the introduction of community benefit clauses in public procurement contracts. So this is designed to build in provisions, um, for example, like ensuring that the, the winner of the contract provides training you know, for local young people. Now, direct support for social enterprise started back in 2007. And this all came about with a long-term strategy and action plan called the Enterprising Third Sector. It's, this is a framework that set out a wide range of measures and created an ecosystem for social enterprise to flourish. And since then, the Scottish Government has probably spent around 74 million uh, UK pounds um, since that time on things like setting up um, new grant funds and loan funds. Um, they've also put in place a national free business support contract, um, leadership development and the opening of um, public sector markets to social enterprises. And here in the backgrounds we see commitment at the absolute highest level. I think in your last session in this room, you had one of your government officials. Well, this is maybe our equivalent. Um, this is Scotland's Deputy First Minister. And he's um, working hard in a social enterprise um, that employs homeless people making um, sandwiches. Um, we couldn't have um, a more su uh, supportive um, person, I think, you know, in charge of social enterprise policy. So the political context in Scotland has increasingly shifted towards a new economy where economic growth, as I mentioned before, goes hand in hand with the promotion of fairness and equality. However, there is still a clear distinction in Scotland between a social enterprise and a business that does good. And we heard yesterday, I think, in the opening remarks um, and speeches, there's still lots of debates over definitions. I'm going to skip that part. I'm just going to give you my definition. <laughs> so this year in Scotland, we carried out the very first social enterprise census. And this has given us the most comprehensive picture of social enterprise in Scotland um, to date. So, Despite its deep roots, social enterprise is on the whole a relatively new and fast growing sector. Scotland has a population of just over 5 million people and we now know that we have one social enterprise for every 1,000 people. So that um, 
I think compared to the Hong Kong stats is slightly more. Yeah. Ten times more. That's easy to remember because the currency is <laughs> ten times more here. <laughs> Um, it's interesting to note, though, that 42% of the social enterprises formed in the last decade, and I think that was the result of a very supportive period of public policy. So I think the government helped lay that framework, but then communities really took control of that and took action for themselves. Um, we can now say with confidence that social enterprise is really contributing to the economy in Scotland. Um, we know that the sector commands a net worth of 3.86 billion and employs 112,000 people, supporting over 16,000 volunteering opportunities. Um, and when you look at the broad national picture, we see social enterprises have the strongest presence in community amenities, arts and creative industries, childcare, and health and social care, which I picked up yesterday, seems to be a big area um, in Hong Kong too. And we're also walking the walk. We're leading the way in social enterprise in terms of achieving a more fairer and equal society. We know that gender imbalance is not just a basic issue of equality, but it is a well-recognised business constraint. Businesses do better when we have a much more diverse workforce. Um, social enterprise in Scotland is embracing this. Um, more than half uh, of so, uh, so social enterprises, you know, have more than half of women leading them uh, in terms of uh, who's on boards, and three out of every five um, social enterprises are being led by a woman. If we compare that with the FTSE 100 companies, um, it stands in stark contrast. Um, in the private sector, only 24% of board directorships are held by women, and only 9% of executive directorships um, are held by women. And when we look at wages, we see a real effort to pay a fair wage to all. Just over two-thirds of social enterprises um, are paying the national living wage. And we also see a much flatter and equal pay structure across these organisations. So that now brings me on to Firstport, the organisation um, that I um, run. One of the most important things we recognised in Scotland was the need to stimulate and nurture a new pipeline of social entrepreneurs. So what we do is we start with the individual person. Back in 2006, we persuaded the Scottish Government that social entrepreneurship had to form part of their wider social enterprise strategy. And we presented them with a proposition that included um, setting up a specific fund for individuals and also a specific business um, support service. The Scottish Government was fully supportive and Firstport formed itself as a charity and since then, social entrepreneurship has played a key part in the government's social enterprise policy. So, at First Port, we like to think of ourselves as the go-to agency for all social entrepreneurs in Scotland. We provide people with seed funding, advice and training, practical tools, and access um, to mentoring. And more recently, we have established locally based co-working spaces in places where we want to stimulate more activity. And we also created an accelerator because we recognise the need that we have lots of social enterprises in Scotland but they stay quite small. So what we need to do is help them to flourish and grow and scale to increase their impacts. So, Here's the difference that First Port's made. We've supported more than 4,000 people, investing just over 3.2 million pounds. Every week, we help establish two new social enterprises. Those who continue on their journey and set up a company, on average, are creating 2.7 full-time jobs and are generating around 56,000 um, pounds within two years. 
But the really encouraging thing um, for me is when we looked at the survival rates. It's easy to start up a business, but it's more difficult to keep it going. But we now know that three out of every five startups that we support are still trading after five years. So sharing, collaborating, co-working and networking have all been vital to our agenda. So I'd now like to share the story of this, the individual people that we're working with and some of the lessons that we've learned. And I think I just, I'm going to highlight this through the, some individual entrepreneurs because um, I think sometimes we concentrate too much on the mechanisms and the support. You have to see that in the context of the people that are actually out doing the hard work and running the enterprises. So hopefully you'll enjoy some of their, their stories. So firstly, we wanted more people from more diverse backgrounds and more start, uh, places to start up social enterprises. And the main way that we do this is by running the Social Entrepreneurs Fund. This is a Scotland-wide fund and it is the bedrock of what we do. People can apply for up to £5,000 to test out an idea or they can apply for up to £25,000 if they have proven their concept works. We've supported hundreds of people through the Social Entrepreneurs Fund, from community bakeries in our rural villages to childcare in our cities. So let me tell you the story of someone that we've supported. Injirani set up Networks for Learning to refurbish technology and build com computer networks. At the heart of his business was his desire to simultaneously address issues of unemployment in Glasgow and issues of unemployment in sub-Saharan Africa. He also wanted to reduce technological um, waste. So what Injirani does is he trains young people from low-income households uh, in Glasgow to refurbish the technology and then he sells this to schools and universities in Kenya who cannot afford or access it. So we helped him get started by providing him with free business support and seed funding and he used the seed funding to um, build a website, his marketing materials and also it helped pay for his salary for a year. So Injirani is just um, one of the stories um, of the people um, that we've supported um, through the funds and we've, le we've been learning lots of lessons because we've been running this um, for a number of years, so let me share some of those with you. So here are my top tips. Money combined with support will achieve much better outcomes. Once you award the seed funding, work on the person's pers uh, personal development plan. This will help build confidence, act as a, a critical friend and help them to set goals. Help people to share and connect. If anyone's had any experience of setting up a business, you'll know that it's, um, it's lonely. So one of the things that we do is we bring people together from all over Scotland at central venues um, so that they can work together and they can share experiences. And finally, don't forget to celebrate success. We use our own communications and marketing expertise to help tell each entrepreneur's story locally and nationally. So this is helping them achieve recognition, but it's also helping the wider public understand about what social enterprise is. So, as well as running an open national programme, we also want to drill deeper down into our communities because we want social enterprise to help our towns, villages and cities to be great places to work, live, learn and create. So let me tell you about Beyond the Finish Line. This was a dynamic programme that we delivered um, in 2014 in my hometown, Glasgow. Why 2014 and why Glasgow? Well, that was easy. The 2014 Commonwealth Games were coming and the city was buzzing, there was real excitement and I really wanted social entrepreneurs to be part of that legacy. 
So thanks to a grant from the Big Lottery Fund, we launched Beyond the Finish Line in January 2014 and set about inspiring a group of young social entrepreneurs. We wanted them to set up new social enterprises in the run-up to the 2014 Games. We took on a short-term lease on a vacant property in Glasgow and um, within one week we transformed this into a flexible uh, city centre um, co-working space and you see a picture in the background that, um, that tells you that. I, I wish now I'd put the before picture up because you would then realise how hard we had to work to get it to look um, like this. So many of the young people that we were working with, um, they were from the creative industries. Um, they were incredibly um, inspiring. Um, so I'm just going to briefly just tell you some of the ideas um, that we worked with. So, for example, we helped um, a couple of young girls to de um, develop an enterprise where they took old pieces of furniture um, and upcycled them and taught people how to turn them into something new. We also worked with young illustrators um, who created these amazing window displays around the city, you know, in empty shops and galleries and restaurants. And we even had an aquaponic system um, mounted onto a bicycle, which was to teach people and inspire them about urban uh, food production. So again, we learned a lot from this program. Uh, but here's some of the key points I'd like to share with you uh, today. The first one is uh, have a hook that everyone can understand and identify with. It will make your publicity so much easier. Um, it will create momentum and enthusiasm. Um, and it might even unlock funding. For us, it was the Commonwealth Games and something that felt events-based, time and now worked really well. Um, run an exciting campaign to find people because they won't just come to, to you. Um, make it um, feel like a prize to gain a place. Um, but that will also give them confidence and put effort into making your space look and feel good, but don't spend a lot of money on it. Beg, borrow and negotiate absolutely um, everything. So the last example, I'm going to take some water. Um, is our accelerator. And the reason we did this is we believe that if social enterprise is really going to tackle the deep-rooted social issues, um, then we need to start up social enterprises that can achieve more impact through more ambitious entrepreneurs and high-growth ideas reaching the market. And this is why we are delivering LaunchMe, our social enterprise accelerator. LaunchMe was on a mission to find the most ambitious uh, early stage social enterprises and our aim is to help these um, enterprises raise repayable loan finance from traditional private sector um, business um, investors. We selected 14 enterprises and de designed a rigorous program of business support. Um, it included advice, it included accountancy um, support, peer-to-peer -peer learning workshops, and we also matched them with industry um, mentors. Now, the crucial point about LaunchMe is we also had access to another grant funding pot. Um, so when a re an enterprise raised money from the investor, the repayable investment, they could come and uh, ask First Port for a grant to match that. So let me tell you about Bruce Gunn one of the um, people that we've supported. Now, Bruce's life changed overnight when an allergic reaction to a mosquito bite left, led him um, to a long-term illness, which left him housebound for three years. Bruce felt he'd joined a lost generation of disabled people, unable to find employment. Um, and then one day he noticed a disabled person and delivering a parcel and he had the light bulb moment and he thought maybe I could set up a courier company that employs disabled people and that's exactly um, what he's done. So 
Bruce now employs 19 people. Um, he wants to expand ev into every town in Scotland. And the great thing about his business is it works for disabled people because it gives them the flexibility around the hours that they can work. Bruce is probably one of the most charismatic people I've had the pleasure um, of, of working with. Um, it was no surprise to me that he was selected to be part of Launch Me. Um, and he has now gone on and successfully raised £70,000 from individual private investors as loans. And we have also matched that with a £70,000 grant. So that has given Bruce £140,000 to grow his business. So here are some of the, the lessons um, from Launch Me. So you don't always have to have a physical space um, to promote co-working. Um, Launch Me is a, a national accelerator across um, Scotland um, and it shows that virtual co-working can be really effective um, too. So we bring the entrepreneurs together who all have different businesses but are all on the same journey um, and they can share their experiences at theme sessions. Um, the second and um, probably one of the most important lessons is about this combination of loan funding and grant funding, it was working really well. Because it means that the enterprise has access to more investors to pull in money, because grant funding is under a lot of pressure. However, with the grant funding, it means they're not taking on too much debt, because these are early stage businesses and they need to be given the room to grow. And finally, build a network. First Port had no connections, none whatsoever, to the private uh, business uh, investor networks. So the first thing that we did was we built our own network. We went out and found two people with great connections and who were willing to share those connections to help us in our journey. So, that's our story and some of the ways that we are helping to grow social entrepreneurship um, in Scotland. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity to, to take part. And I'd like to leave you with a, a favourite quote of mine. Never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, we will hold Q&A later. And um, now we have Buzan sharing with us driving social change in Nigeria. Buzan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Um, you know, when I was coming here, I wasn't really sure what, what to expect. Uh, but, but working in social innovation, I think something that has been really clear to me in the last two to three years is that the field is not necessarily growing as you know, fast as one would expect it to grow. Uh, especially in a continent uh, where I come from, which is Africa, uh, most people tend to think social innovation is just um, a new way of describing civil society. Um, which is non-governmental organization. So there's been, a, there's been serious struggle. And I think Vincent also alluded to it when you said uh, Good Lab is the only uh, co-working space that is focused on social innovation. You know, but I think coming here, um, I'm actually getting a lot from, from, from being part of this. And I think Karen as well, most of the things you've shared, as you're gonna see in my presentation, actually sort of resonates with the work we do and, and also how we go about it. Uh, your last quote as well is, is, is spot on, yeah, in my opinion. I think the world is moved to a stage where the way we do things, uh, the technologies that we consume today, uh, is sort of pushing more and more of us to be enlightened, to have access to information. As, and as a result of that, you find that more people are now interested in being part of shaping their society, which means you have more active citizens than passive citizens. And, and I think that can only be useful for any society. Uh, but the challenge is how do you harness that resources and energy for, for, for social good? 
Uh, and I think that's what social entrepreneurship and social innovation is all about. So my name again is Boston Tijani um, from Nigeria. I founded uh, five years ago um, an organization, a social innovation center called Co-Creation Hub. I uh, simply had of the interest and believe that um, I'm originally from a country with so many issues. I'm going to share some of these issues. And I believe that these issues are not necessarily there because, uh, because that's the destiny of, of the country. I think the issues are there because historically people have not had the opportunity to have a go at trying to solve their own problem. And I believe we're at a stage now where more and more people, even empowered, can actually push their society forward. And that's why we started CCL. But just an introduction to, to Nigeria. How many people here know, know anything about Nigeria? If you know something about Nigeria, can I see you? <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody in the room. Well, the interesting thing about Nigeria is you probably know some, some good things and a lot of bad things uh, about, about Nigeria. Uh, but that's, that's the most populous black nation on it. So there's a statistics that I can't really back up that says one out of every 10 black people you meet is a Nigerian. Uh, I can't back that up, but, but it's that statistics. Uh, but the population is about 183 million people, uh, just to give you an idea of how big it is as a country and how complex it is as well, which is why you probably hear about some of these good and bad things as well, because that's, that's really a big and diverse country. Uh, if you want to put it in context, is, is, you know, look at the population of Ethiopia, which is also quite popular. That's just 94 million people. And Ethiopia is also a big country in Africa. Uh, South Africa, which is quite popular as well, is just about 52 million. Uh, Ghana, which is quite close to Nigeria, is about uh, 25 million. And Gambia is just about 1.8 million. So put that in context and you begin to get an idea of how complex Nigeria is as a country. Uh, the land mass is said to be about close to 1 million square kilometers as well, so it's, it's also big in terms of land. Uh, the official language is English, uh, even though we also have the, uh, the bad English, which, which we call pidgin, uh, that is unique to Nigeria, just as uh, for those who know Jamaica, it's also quite close to uh, the way they twist the English there to have patra. Um, Another complex thing about the country is that even though it's just one country, you actually have over 500 indigenous languages within the country. So people speak in really like languages that I don't even understand. So I think I can only grab about two of, of these 521 languages. So it's a very, very complex country. Uh, in terms of sports, we like football. So, so probably every Nigerian can play football. I'm very good at football, by the way. <laughs> um, and our biggest natural resource is, is, uh, is oil and gas. So it's a very rich country as well. It's really, really rich. Of course, mismanaged, of course. Um, entrepreneurship, on the other hand, is, is also quite big. So the average Nigerian person is quite entrepreneur. You know, that, that's, you know there's, there's different way to explain that. Entrepreneur in what sense? You know, value creation or looking for money. And, and women as well are actually more entrepreneur in Nigeria than, than men, um, as you can see from the statistics. You know, but th these are some of the things you know. So, so that's a Nigeria big opportunity. But in 2015, it's still a country with serious issues around healthcare, uh, huge unemployment, job insecurity, corruption is big, very very big. Uh, bad roads, you know, poor policy, injustice, everything you can think of, you know. The good things are there, but you can also think of all these things. Ah, uh, yeah? So, 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 so that's something to bear in mind. And, and for us, we see this as an opportunity to kick stats and build a great nation. Uh, this, this is not saying we have all this issue and this is our portion in life and we're going to be stuck with it. Which, which is why for us, starting the co-creation of uh, was an exciting challenge. Because as young people, we thought, these are so many things for us to battle with. Why don't we start an organization that is going to focus on this? As against just building businesses that will be looking at making so much money. Yeah? Then the other bit, digital. So, so digital is another reality that we all live in, uh, live with in, 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 in this, uh, this age. Uh, most of us carry mobile phones everywhere we go. And it's not different in Africa as well. It's changing. Yeah? So, so you have the population, again, just to remind you, uh, over 180 million people in Nigeria. Active internet users is already at about 70 million. 
active internet users. It's already at about 70 million. Our social media account, still small, about 13.6 million people. But the exciting part is the mobile connection. So Africa has moved away from, you know, when, when internet access came to the West, it came via dial-ups and via people having a desktop computer in their homes. But when internet came to Africa, it came on mobile. So, so you have a lot of people with smartphones or phones that are somewhat connected in a way, uh, carrying these mobile phones around. And you know, that presents immense opportunity in our, in our opinion. Uh, there, there are challenges around it as well. People ask you questions. People living in the rural area, do they have same access to these things? But if you put it in context and you look at how many people have access to mobile phones, as compared to when it was only land phones, which was something that was only for the middle and upper income class, there's, there's immense opportunity for us to drive change by looking at the mobile phone. Um, we have to look at that. So, so this is what led us to CC up. So, so we thought there's something going on in the country, so many problems, young population, but at the same time, technology is beginning to, 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 to get into the nook and cranny of the country. People are beginning to gain access to, to, to the mobile phone. People are beginning to gain access to connected mobile phones as well. So how can we leverage all these opportunities to try and build a better nation? So in, in 2010, a friend of mine uh, and I, we decided to, we were both in the UK uh, working full time. I was working in a consulting firm. Uh, and he was working for the formal social innovation center in London called Young Foundation. So we decided to go back to Nigeria, set up the organization which is called the Co-Creation Hub. And we thought it was going to be a social innovation center. Our focus was going to be on looking for ways to find smart people within the society who wants to apply their expertise and skills to solve problems. But most importantly, leverage the growing technology platform which is in the country, which is mobile phones. <laughs> it became the first innovation hub. Uh, I think we were, we were quite fortunate when we started. Uh, people, the likes of Google came to our rescue. Nokia then also came to our rescue. It took a bit of time, about six months, for us to get it going. But after six months, support came from everywhere you can think of. So, so we had a lot of cash to play with in terms of trying to set up something. You know, so, so it was a bit easy, you know, I, I, I'll say that. It, it wasn't as difficult as we thought it was going to be. Uh, because, you know, I left my job, I invested all the money I had into it. But after six months, it then became really easy for us to get things going. And I think these organizations as well could see that if you support an entity like this, and, and we, we're, we're able to begin to inspire, which is another thing about social innovation that I think a lot of people misunderstand. And when we try to measure the success as well, it's not always about the hard results, the hard facts, or, or the result that comes out of this project at times. It's about the inspiration that you give to people that they have the ability to begin to think of how their society would be in future. Uh, which is the same thinking they, they use in technology. So if you're, if you're used to the way they do things in the Silicon Valley where uh, you know, someone starts a Facebook and investors put so much money behind it, and the ordinary thinking businessman cannot figure out how a Facebook would make money. Uh, that's the same thinking that we apply to social innovation. In the sense that when people try to change their society in a way, enable them, push them forward, let them try. It's all about experimentation. In the process of experimenting, you will learn something that will then lead to the change you want to see. And if you don't allow people to try, you will never stumble upon some of this knowledge. And, and that's the way we do our work. Um, so we have an interesting methodology, and that's, this is our co-creation, and also the, the whole idea of co-working space uh, came into our work. Uh, so we decided to form what we call the community. So, so for us, it was important to start first with a community as against space. Because the thinking is clear that you may have a co-working space, but if you don't have the right community to work from within the co-working space, uh, you're still not going to be able to achieve what you want to achieve. So it's not about the space but the people. So, so our community is quite vibrant. We have so many software developers in our community. That's actually the base of our community because the thinking was we'll use technology in any smart way possible in everything we do. Um, of course, we have people from universities as well within our community. We have public agencies as well because it's important for those guys to be part of what we do. Even though we focus on experimentation at the beginning, for you to be able to scale some of these ideas, 
in, within the social space, you need to work with governments and public agencies. So, so they're an important part of, part of what we do. And of course, as I mentioned, the likes of Google funded us, Nokia, Microsoft, so technology companies as well uh, from, from beginning were part of uh, uh, the thinking. And, and it was simple. We just thought we want to create a place where we can facilitate creative thinking. You know, at the least, that's, that's what we wanted to create. And, and again, if, if, if you understand the challenges in a society like where I come from, uh, you begin to, to understand that even encouraging people to think creatively is success. <laughs> because people have been used to a situation whereby they sit back, expect the government to do things for them, expect civil society organizations to do things for them. Empowering them to be able to think about how they want to see their society is success. So we thought that was going to be the base of what we would do. Uh, we also saw that technology was already becoming a major part of the world we live in. Uh, whether Africa is there yet or not is not a question. Uh, the question is that we can't be successful without using technology smartly. So, so we thought technology was going to be the core of the work we do in this space. Um, we also said it's going to be a mini living lab, and the concept of living lab for us is that we want our community to be the kind of community where when you create a solution, you can easily test that solution from within the community before you even take it out to your society and begin to get the idea of, of what you want to see. But also engage the people that will end up using your solution so that they can help you test at a really early stage. Uh, and you can engage them in the process of building the solution. And, and I think lastly, we thought it, it was going to be important for us also to build skills, help people build skills that they will need to be successful. So if we come across a social entrepreneur, someone who is doing something really good, and, and maybe that's their first time of ever thinking of building a business, uh, you may need to find ways to help them build the right skills to sustain it, their business. So, so that was an essential part of our community as well. And lastly, uh, we wanted to create a serendipity machine, a place where people connect, where people share, where people talk, and we believe that it's in that process of people engaging one another that things will actually happen beyond what you can imagine. Um, so, so we've been doing this for, for, like I said, for about five years. Two years ago, we decided to start uh, an incubation uh, center within the space where when we come across someone doing something really good, uh, we not only give them an office space, so aside from the co-working space, we have another floor which is dedicated to businesses building uh, social ventures. But we also then invest money into them. Uh, so we started that two years ago where we were putting between ten to $25,000 into into businesses. And this has been so successful that this year, in about three weeks' time, we're launching another fund, which is going to be $5 million, and that would invest up to $150,000 US dollars into businesses. So, so we expect that some of the businesses that we've invested in at this stage will then be able to attract more funding and from there be able to uh, scale their, their ventures. Uh, we also then leverage the incubation center to also give you know, experienced entrepreneurs access to those that are just building their businesses so that they can also serve as mentors to them and encourage them and advise them on how to, how to build their businesses. Most importantly as well, we believe that you find entrepreneurs who are doing really good things, but at the same time, they don't know how to manage their accounting, they don't know how to deal with the legal issues. And at the very early stage, we don't believe that the best way is to, to burden them with trying to transfer that knowledge to them. So we have an in-house team and in some cases, consultants who then provide the services to them, then we pay these consultants to provide accounting services to them, legal recruitment, HR, uh, HR support to, uh, to the guys in our, in our incubation center. And I guess the other is just, I've, I've spoken about the office. Our office is, is, is one of the few really modern uh, co-working spaces in Africa, actually. Uh, the internet access is also quite good, so we partnered with an internet company that gives us 45 Mbps internet for free. Uh, and they've been doing that for the last five years as well. So, I think the best way to probably continue at this stage will be to share some of the stories of, of a few of the guys in our portfolio and some of the projects that we've been able to achieve and accomplish from within the, the innovation center. So this one is common, I think in most countries where uh, you have local dialects and, and, and languages. Uh, you find that modernization is beginning to push the kids away from really just 
imbibing the American British culture, speak English, and try to forget everything else. Uh, so we have the same in Nigeria where the growing middle class, their kids are suffering. They can't really speak the local language. They know nothing about the culture. Uh, so a team from within, uh, within our center decided they were going to build animations that will focus on telling the stories and teaching kids the local la language. Uh, and they were going to do that by putting it on, on, on mobile apps and also on tablets so that the parents can actually download the apps and hand it over to their kids and the kids can learn the languages in, in really interesting way. So this was one of the ventures that, that came into our portfolio at the very early stage. Um, as at the time, I think I used this, this deck uh, probably three months ago. So as of then, they had about 65,000 app downloads, um, uh, which, which is on the store. And the interesting thing about this as well is the bulk of this download, so, so which, is, which is part of what I said about experimentation. So the bulk of these downloads actually came from Brazil. Brazil, yeah. <laughs> so, so when they were building this solution, they were building this solution for kids in Nigeria. But what they didn't know is that the, there's a language in Nigeria called Yoruba, which is well spoken in Brazil. Oh. Because apparently during, during slave, slave trade, most of the black people in Brazil were taken from West Africa. And they speak this language, their culture is quite close to our culture. And they actually care more about keeping in touch with their roots than even people in Africa. So, so that's, that's something they've discovered. So the team is now thinking of, of going on a trip to Brazil, actually, to understand their users better, which is why I think experimentation in social innovation is really, really important, because you don't know what you're going to meet when you're building this solution. So it's, it's an interesting one. Are they very successful? I'm not sure, depending on how you describe success, you know, because 65,000 download is probably not the best. But in terms of impact, uh, what they're doing is quite unique, and, and they're trying to tweak their model as well. So, so they're thinking of improving the quality of their, uh, of their animation, going into producing for TV as well, because there are kids who still don't have access to tablets, and, and they can enjoy this on, on TV. Um, this is another one that is interesting, probably not a problem in the West, but it can also be. So, so, so yesterday we had the opening session at, at the stadium, and I was fascinated when I saw the stadium because I, I walked past it earlier and I saw people playing basketball, football, and things like that. And, and in the UK as well, I've seen that where in every uh, almost local area, you find what they call the sports centers, which has been built by the government. And I think it's the same in, in Hong Kong as well. But we don't have that in, 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 in most cities in Africa. So, so the government is not invested enough in infrastructure. But the sad thing is that the middle class in Africa is also growing. And access to information means people also know there is the need to stay physically active. People know that they need to exercise. People know that they, they need to make sure that you know, they do sports. But unfortunately, they don't have the infrastructure to support that. So a team within the hub and myself, so this actually came from my need. Because when I was in the UK, I played football every, every, every week. When I moved back to Nigeria, I couldn't play football. So we decided we're going to start building an app. And what the app will do is to help you find places where you can do sports uh, first, but beyond that, help you find people you can do sports with. So if I'm coming into Lagos and I want to play football, I don't know where to start. I should be able to find people playing football on the hub. And I should be able to find where to play football on the hub. I should be able to find people running on the hub and I should be able to join them and run with them. And that's the thinking behind. And we think this is something that is quite unique to Africa, but at the same time, it's applicable everywhere you go. I'm going to be in Hong Kong for a week. If I'm back home, I run twice or, or you know, three times a week. I'd love to run here, but my first challenge was, where's the best route to run on the island? You know? And when I started asking questions, people said, I need to go to the harbor. That would, that would be the best place to run. What if I could find people running in Hong Kong on the harbor? And you know, I just join them and we run together. So that's the concept. But this is, this is more relevant in Africa because the infrastructure is not there. And we believe that this can become the infrastructure for physical activities on the continent. So what are they doing? Uh, they, they're warming up before a 5K run. <laughs> so wow. it sounds like you guys. So. 